I'm Pat Gunn, and this is another philosophy video. Happy International Labor Day. So as you might know, Labor Day has long been a holiday associated with the organized labor movement. Uh, in the United States, however, uh, the holiday was moved. And it was moved primarily because Americans, uh, or at least the American political class at the time, grew uncomfortable with organized labor, particularly the international bent, as it uh, tended to lead people towards uh, socialism. And so they decided to move the holiday sometime into, I think, September or something like that. And they passed the law and officially, to the extent that holidays are ever official things, in the United States, Labor Day is off on some other day. Um, so that's it's an interesting historical tidbit, but I, I think it's interesting to to cover why why uh, organized labor has tended to lead in the direction of socialism. And as a socialist, I'm happy to explain what I mean when I say I'm a socialist, because a lot of people have at least a lot of the people that I've gotten into discussions with on the internet have rather confused notions about what socialism is. This isn't helped by the fact that different socialist movements often themselves have large disagreements about what socialism is. They might disagree both in the broad sense and in the particulars. So to me, socialism, uh, it's, it's a purely economic system. Uh, or I mean, it's it's purely a uh, statement of, uh, about economics of of a nation or the economic system that a political movement wishes to achieve, and it's a statement uh, about ownership. Who owns the means of production? That is, who owns companies? Who owns factories? Uh, who decides how? Uh, labor is organized. So when you look at a traditional modern democratic capitalist uh, country and you ask where are the decisions made that decide how, uh, how most people live their lives, how most jobs are structured, um, uh, what types of uh, what types of programs are there, how are people educated, and you, you find a wide variety of decisions that are being made by various different groups in society. Some of them are public, some of them are private. And by private, we typically mean uh, an individual owner who I've, or, or, well, an individual uh, who happens to either own a company or who happens to administer the company on behalf of the owners. And like com uh, companies that that are public in the sense that their stock is widely distributed, and the stock owners have little relationship, uh, a little direct relationship to how the company is run. Uh, they'll uh, hire management. They'll hire a, a uh, CEO or manager, and that person will hire all of the rest of the. Uh, management infrastructure for the company and they'll end up uh, hiring the workers and decide what the work conditions will be like, how much they're paid, what are the policies, things like that. Whereas in a, in a number of businesses instead you end up having one person or a few people who remain affiliated with the company uh, owning it and they make the decisions. And then you have the government and the government is theoretically and mostly accountable to the people in a democratic capitalist society uh, and it provides certain services uh, it uh, it administers the laws of the country um, and I mean certainly in the United States you, you have the three branches of government each with fairly distinct roles but uh, the, the government is, by and large, a, a tool of the people, and it's the institution that's most accountable to, uh, to, uh, to the people. You could argue that businesses are accountable to the people at large to a certain extent because people 
can decide whether they want to be customers of that business or not. But the ability of customers to finely tune the behavior of a business is limited. And there are many businesses that don't in fact do any, uh, don't have any dealings with the general public. They sell to other businesses primarily. Um, or they sell to the government. Uh, those, those companies are very well insulated uh, and they can, uh, they can set their policies however they like provided that, that their policies keep them uh, business afloat. But it means that they're not accountable to the general public. So yeah, you have the government on one hand which is generally accountable to uh, with a, I mean, uh, to uh, it's accountable in a very rough-grained kind of way. And then you have companies which are largely not accountable. And when it comes to the ability to set policy, uh, particularly with legislature, which is the branch of government that probably sees the most in involvement from the uh, from the general public, you. Uh, you end up seeing more accountability than the other two branches of government. And this, this was by design. When the, when the founders of the uh, United States uh, were setting up the government, they were looking at Machiavelli, in particular Machiavelli's discourses. Uh, and they saw the idea of a productive tension between different branches of society and thought that uh, that's a useful thing to have in a government. And the legislature was meant uh, to be more accountable. You have a quicker election cycle uh, for the legislature. Um, the judiciary is highly ins uh, insulated from the general public. Uh, and this is because the concerns of justice are, they're much more concerned with, with long-term consistency than other types of governmental decisions. And so it wasn't seen as desirable to have the changing whims of the public uh, directly involved in, uh, in court cases or in, in interpretations of law. It's too easy for someone to charm the public and, de and decide, I'm such a great person, I deserve leniency from certain types of law that other people don't have. And uh, the fickleness of, of the public was, is generally seen to be less damaging in leg legislature and, uh, and the benefits of having the people involved in legislative decisions are much greater. So uh, uh, again, focusing on, on the private sector then, you, you end up having uh, a lot of decisions made that shape a lot of lives uh, by, uh, by companies and in particular by the people who exercise power in companies who have little accountability to the general public. And so this is what, what I would call the, the petty dictatorship of, uh, um, of uh, private capital. Now it's you could argue that it's not exactly a dictatorship because someone's all but, uh, always free to leave uh, to leave a company, and that's true, or at least it's it's usually true. There are occasionally contracts that limit people's ability to do that, but ignoring non-competes and binding contracts and things along those lines, it's largely true. But it's also largely true that people are permitted to leave a country should they become displeased with it. And there's the question of should people be, should they be forced to make that kind of choice? Do they deserve a say in the decisions that are, uh, that are being made that's going to impact their lives so much? And I would say yes. And this is, an, uh, this is one of the reasons why I can't support uh, capitalism. So, Instead of having private ownership of the means of production and the petty dictatorship of capital, I advocate public ownership of the means of production. And by that, I mean that businesses 
are not necessarily the only way to structure those kinds of working arrangements. And I would instead have collectives. But I would still have more than one collective working in any sphere. Like right now, you have a number of automakers. You have Ford, you have uh, Honda, you at one point had Studebaker. Uh, you, you have uh, all these companies that are competing to make cars. And I would say we should instead be seeing collectives that are competing to make cars. They should still compete. You ideally want more than one of them. You want them making different decisions, uh, different business decisions, uh, within certain realms at least, uh, to feel out what the best way to do things are. And you can accumulate wisdom often just by uh, trying out a lot of stuff in parallel and seeing what works and keeping the stuff that works and tossing aside the stuff that doesn't. That's part of how capitalism works. It's a good thing. Competition is very healthy. Competition between collectives could be just as healthy if it's structured correctly. Uh, we still would need to figure out how to get the self-interested judgment involved here. Uh, but I think that the self-interested judgment should be much broader. It should be judgments of the workers uh, within a collective. When somebody, when somebody is, is working, I think that they should be considered to have a right to participate in determination for how their labor is used, uh, including the conditions of where they're working, which means that every workplace should be a democracy and people this would require people to be a lot more informed about how companies work how their field works uh, what are the actual decisions being made and in the end I would expect that uh, that there would be more fluidity as people moved from one collective to another but uh, the collectives also would bear some of the uh, consequences of some of the business decisions uh, that they make. And the uh, compensation to their members would depend somewhat on the results of what they voted for. So uh, ideally this would humanize the business practice. If a company, uh, if a collective faced a decision between experimenting with a more ecologically friendly or a more uh, let's let's shift the example a, a more ecologically risky but more efficient uh, measure or a more uh, more conservative uh, measure that that would be have relatively known risks to uh, to the environment and have relatively known production costs you ideally would have companies that are willing to explore both. And if they actually do end up creating an ecological disaster, that collective would have to pay a fine and it would come out of the general funds, which would impact the, uh, the wages that they would end up paying uh, their members. But they would also potentially reap the benefits. What if, for example, it turned out that the risks were not as big as they thought they were when, uh, once they've tested it, maybe refined it. And, and in the private sector, in our existing economies, this kind of calculation happens all the time. Uh, companies don't make the same decisions except where they have to by law. And generally, and I mean, particularly when it comes to employment, most of the restrictions are you, you can't hire or fire people based on their religion, their race, a few other protected categories. You have to have a, a safe workplace Things like that, things that are reasonable everywhere and you would be bothered to hear about a company not doing them. But when it comes to deciding, um, I'm going to bet that if we make this product, uh, this many people will buy it. Um, or I'm going to bet that, that we can find a way to improve this process to the point where it's a lot more efficient than what we're doing now. And, and the, they experiment. And we can't deal without that, which is why absolute centralization of labor, even on an industry le uh, level, is undesirable. But democracy in the workplace 
uh, I think it, it doesn't uh, doesn't go against competition if it's structured correctly, and it's highly desirable because it lets people a avoid a lot of the abuses that can happen uh, in the workplace, and b it, it exposes businesses to the innovation to uh, that can come from having a whole lot of people feeling fully vested and in, in their collective and feel like they have a personal stake. And C, it, it humanizes labor uh, in, in the sense that <clears throat> ah, sorry, it, uh, it humanizes labor in the sense that they, you no longer have this divide between workers and, uh, and employers. Uh, you end up actually having uh, you, you don't have management except management that the workers hire to manage them. And the management is, uh, is on the same team as the employers. They're, if, somebody, uh, if somebody thinks, I'm not making enough, uh, enough money to support themselves, they can make their case to, the, to either the, uh, the other workers around them or they can uh, make their case to any appointed and uh, obedient management structure that already has general metrics for how people are paid. And if they have issues with safety, they bring it up, they talk with all the rest of the workers. Uh, and actually being responsible for the well-being of the company, uh, or the collective I should say, means that the workers are, uh, their demands have to be reasonable. Uh, and they have, and not only do they have to be reasonable, but they're responsible for their reasonability. And, uh, and so, yes, it, it does require more education on the part of workers. It probably would involve a lot more politics, a lot more discussion. But in the end, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I hope that it it would lead to greater efficiency, but even if it didn't, that's okay. Uh, I think it's enough to, to feel that it's the right thing to do. And you avoid even the worry about having the management uh, of a company or the owners of a, uh, of a company extracting most of the wealth to live uh, lavish lifestyles. If you have complete openness in a, co uh, in a company, uh, or in a collective, I should say, uh, and if everything is up for a vote, then you're probably going to see wages being a little bit more even. Not completely even, because probably the collective will, will realize that some forms of labor are more worthwhile than others. And uh, some types of training are things that maybe not everybody needs, uh, but they are refined skills uh, that that some people need, and so they they might pay more to retain talent. But all of these things would be kept reasonable by the democratic process. And I think democracy in the workplace is actually more important than democracy on the national level. Which isn't to say that I'm necessarily against democracy on the national level. I'm more or less neutral on it. But democracy in in the workplace pretty important. And, uh, and in general, the, the profits that, that come from a collective, uh, so they ideally belong mostly to the members of the, uh, of the collective, but you would also end up having the state generally um, act as a bankroller for ventures. Uh, or, I mean, conceivably, you could partially uh, you could collectivize that as well. Um, there are all sorts of different ways to lay out an economy. Uh, some of them are capitalist, some of them are socialist, some of them are a variety of other systems that, that you could imagine. Like if you had an economy that were not owned by workers, uh, nor the general public, nor uh, nor capital owning classes, but instead, if you organized an, an entire economy like a university, you wouldn't call that capitalist or socialist. It's something else. 
likewise, you could have all sorts of variety within uh, either of those systems. We could imagine a top-down um, centralized production version of socialism. It probably wouldn't work very well, but it's certainly imaginable. It has been tried. Um, we can imagine all sorts of varieties of capitalism. Uh, the laissez-faire style, we could imagine a, a capitalism with strong intervention to prevent, um, uh, to, pr uh, to keep the, this idea of perfect competition. It's, it's a term from economic theory. It has a, a, number, of, um, a number of conditions for what, uh, what needs to be there for competition to be maximally healthy by, by the framing of, uh, uh, of capitalist theory. And it's not something that's actually compatible with laissez-faire. Ideally, for perfect competition, you want a high number of competitors, a low barrier to entry. I'm sorry, I have a cat who really seems to want to participate here. Uh, and you have a lot of information on all sides about what the products are, what the possibilities are, what the costs are and will be, and so on. And you could imagine market in intervention, antitrust lawsuits, uh, all sorts of financial aid to keep that perfect uh, competition or something near to it in place. Or you could imagine laissez-faire, which would often result in big monopolies in some industries. Uh, in other industries, it wouldn't. It depends on the industry. You could imagine a capitalism that has very strong public services, or you could imagine one that has privatized almost everything. All of them you'd call them capitalism because the means of production are still in private hands. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's a lot of variety in what's, uh, in what's possible out there and, and what kinds of economic systems they are, uh, or there are. So I guess to, uh, as a final topic for this, uh, this Labor Day video, um, I'd, I'd like to express generally my support for unions as uh, as a as a way to compensate for uh, difficulties in actually creating decent workplaces and decent wages in a capitalist society. Unions aren't perfect. Neither is government. That's not a reason to hate them. It's not a reason to try and dismantle them. Uh, we're better off with them than without them. Uh, unions often, because of their advers uh, adversarial nature with, uh, with businesses, which isn't always there, um, one sec, uh, they often make demands that are not uh, reasonable for a business. Because they're purely in the interest of advancing the interests of their workers uh, and because they're absent from the business decisions. They neither have the accountability for the policies they request nor the knowledge needed to, to know what amount of the profits uh, they can manage to, uh, to push into wages. And those have limited their functionality. You, you also end up having some types of in institutionalized corruption within the union structure. It happens. Same thing with, with uh, government, uh, particularly with the military industrial complex. But you have to compare them to uh, the business owners. Business owners typically see their workers as resources, nothing more. They're in the business of maximizing profit. Now, this isn't always the case for small businesses, particularly because in, in small businesses, they often get a kind of family atmosphere. Um, they, uh, they, treat, uh, they treat their workers as, as members of the business family. They share the profits relatively well with them. Uh, they're engaging with them as humans. They don't have this policy layer of it's our business policy to do X, and if you're not comfortable with that, you can hit the road. Uh, or if you have a particular need that's not meetable completely generically, uh, 
it's just not going to happen. Uh, like, if I mean, but before we had regulations on this topic, if somebody uh, was on crutches and had a tough time with stairs, uh, they uh, a small business owner probably would be willing to to help them get up the uh, the stairs or would put down a ramp or something like that. A large business probably would just say, well, we rather just hire somebody who doesn't have that problem. You can hit the road. We'll, uh, we'll put out an ad and get somebody new. That's uh, that's a problem. But um, when you ended up having organized labor, uh, they, they recognized that some people uh, became very, very rich through uh, organizing companies. Andrew Carnegie, great example. Um, and most of the workers were still struggling to get by. So they organized strikes and sit-ins, and uh, they would blockade entrances to factories, uh, and they would unionize, and they would demand better conditions, better pay, uh, and eventually, over a very, very long time, we got down to the eight-hour workday. We uh, ended up not having kids uh, working dangerous factory equipment. Uh, we had safer working conditions. We had negotiations between workers and employers. That's a very good thing. It's a very healthy thing. Um, because in the existing relations, even though it was great that, that people had jobs, they had very little say. They got a little bit more say thanks to organized labor. And they kept it thanks to organized labor. And uh, and unions were essential to this. They started this type of negotiation process with employers. I'm glad that unions existed. I'm glad that unions still exist, despite many of the well-publicized issues with corruption that they've had. Because if you consider what they're up against, if you consider the, the kinds of money grabbing that happens with employers, uh, the very, very large slices of profit that go into management and the relatively smaller slices that go into um, go into the the people who actually make whatever it is that's being sold. You begin to think that the system itself is continually performing an injustice uh, through that uh, division of, uh, of profits. And the the problems that you see in unions, they're not that big. And unions generally are more or less democratic. Uh, they make their decisions together about how to do various things, about what their demands should be. That type of participation is fantastic. And I just think that eventually we want to complete it by moving to collectives. Uh, and so that uh, that generally con uh, that concludes this video. Uh, I hope you have a great Labor Day. I hope some of these uh, these thoughts have at least been interesting for you. You don't have to disagree with them. If uh, if you want to uh, want to comment, at least for a certain amount of time, I'd be uh, I'd be happy to chat with you in the comments section uh, below on the video. Um, and because this topic is of particular interest to me, eventually I stop reading the comments uh, on a video and go off and do other things. If I'm non-responsive after a certain amount of time, drop me an email and uh, we can chat about it. Uh, maybe I'll do another video with a follow-up on some of your questions or arguments. Maybe I'll blog about it. Maybe we'll just have a nice exchange of emails. Um, but yes, I'm proud of the labor movement. Uh, I like unions, uh, and I think that we have a lot to thank the labor union for, both historically and nowadays. Thanks.